Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, the third chapter, verses 1 through 10. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, you are invited to do so at this time. It's on page 863. Let's all listen for God's word to us today. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? and yet you do not understand these things. The word of the Lord. With uh, baseball season right around the corner, I was thinking this past week that it has been a while since I mentioned the New York Yankees from this pulpit. And I can tell by the looks on your faces you were hoping I would say that this morning. So, I don't want to disappoint, on September 4th, 1993, in a game I almost went to, on that day, something remarkable took place at Yankee Stadium. Jim Abbott, a pitcher for the New York Yankees, threw a no-hitter. Now, why is that remarkable? Plenty of pitchers have thrown no-hitters in Major League Baseball. What made this no-hitter notable is that Jim Abbott was born with only one hand. He is, to the best of my knowledge, the only major league ball player with one hand ever to pitch a complete game without allowing a hit. A few years ago, I read a biography of Jim Abbott. There were pictures in the book, pictures of Jim as a young boy growing up in Michigan. And do you know what Jim Abbott used to do as a young boy when his picture was taken? He would take the arm that did not have a hand and he would put it in his pocket because he did not any, want anyone to notice in the picture. He wanted to be like every other kid, just an ordinary kid. When his picture was taken, he did not want to stand out. And we can understand that, right? I mean, the reason we can understand it is not only that all the adults in this room were also kids one day and wanted to be like all the other kids. The reason we get it is that there are still plenty of moments when we, too, just want to blend in, just want to be ordinary people, don't really want to stand out. Have you ever been wary of standing out? I have a vivid memory of growing up at my home church in Michigan, and if we were running late and were arriving at worship late, I would always say a silent prayer that there would be space in the pew in back so that we would not have to go all the way to the front and everybody would see us arriving late up front. I did not want to stand out. I recall my very first day in the ministry 22 years ago, April 1st, 1998. There was a 7 a.m. Bible study at the church in which I was starting my ministry as an associate pastor in Richardson, Texas. I went to the Wednesday morning Bible study that first day, and everyone in the room there was excited. They were friendly. They were very welcoming. I was excited to be there. And then one of the gentlemen at the table told me that while he was really glad to see me there, 
If I ever wore a tie again to that Wednesday morning Bible study, he was going to take me to what was the Trail Dust Restaurant right outside of Dallas because if you wore a tie to the Trail Dust Restaurant, they would cut that tie off and they would hang it on the restaurant wall. And I looked around and it wasn't just that the senior pastor was not wearing a tie. None of the guys that were at the table were wearing ties. Do you think I ever wore a tie again? Not a chance. I was new to Texas. I was new to that church. I wanted to be liked by the people there. I did not want to stand out. I think, I think in the third chapter of John, we have a story about someone who was a little afraid of standing out. His name was Nicodemus. And John tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee a leader of the Jews who came to Jesus to have a conversation, but he came when? Did you catch this? He came by night. By night. Why by night? John does not explain, but I think we can make a pretty good guess. Nicodemus wanted to keep that visit a secret. Perhaps he did not want his friends to know that he was curious about Jesus. Perhaps there would be questions if people in his circle of friends found out that he was hanging out with Jesus. On the one hand, Nicodemus, clearly interested in Jesus. On the other hand, he did not want to stand out. And we get that, right? I mean, we are Presbyterians, frozen chosen, locked to blend in. In fact, Jesus himself talks about the importance of not standing out. Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you. When you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't stand out. Those are words that we love to live by. Are those words? that we love to live by. Imagine with me for just a moment that there are some visitors sitting next to you or nearby you in the pews right now. Imagine that it is their first time here at Westminster. And I'm gonna take a minute in this sermon to tell them something about this congregation that they have decided to visit. What should I tell them about Westminster? Should I say to them, you know what? We're just an ordinary church. We're just a blend-in kind of church. You can't tell the difference between Westminster Presbyterian Church and any other Presbyterian congregation that's nearby. So stay if you want, go if you want. Nothing really remarkable about our church. Is that what I should say? Or should I say that we're a growing church? That we have over 100 teenagers at our youth group meetings every Sunday night that we've got over 500 children who are in fifth grade and younger at our church, that we've got a ministry to house families experiencing homelessness, and four times a year anyone in our congregation can volunteer for that ministry, that we have an outreach to the Dominican Republic and to Cuba, that we have exceptional adult education classes on Sunday mornings, that we've got this splendid choir that sings gorgeous music every time we worship? Should I say that we're an open church, a welcoming church, an inclusive church, that one would be hard-pressed to find another Presbyterian church in Greenville that's like our church? Is that what I should say? Or should I say, eh, we're not much different than any other church? Would you like Westminster to stand out? Do you see the tension here? The tension between blending in, being ordinary, and standing out. Of course, that tension is not quite the same tension that is in our text. Nicodemus is afraid of standing out, not because standing out would make him exceptional, Nicodemus is afraid that standing out would make him controversial, that it would cost him something. That's why I think he came by night. He doesn't want this Jesus stuff to cost him something. 
So what do you think? I mean, not, not just about Nicodemus and his relationship with Jesus. What about your relationship with Jesus? Is it supposed to cost you something? When the preacher Will Campbell died a few years ago, the New York Times noted how Campbell was the only white person invited by Martin Luther King Jr. to the founding of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. On the one hand, Campbell was a fierce advocate for African Americans, an outspoken opponent of our country's racism. Those stances earned him enemies as well as friends along the way. And in the midst of his civil rights work, Campbell gave a significant amount of his time to imprisoned Ku Klux Klan members. That did not sit well with plenty of people either. For example, he visited Tommy Terrence, a Klansman at Parchman Prison. Terrence, filled with hate and a terrorist, was a key figure in the Klan program of violence. When Terrence attempted to bomb the home of a progressive Jewish businessman, the FBI set a trap and nearly killed him. His crime gained Terrence a 30-year prison sentence. It was then that Campbell began to visit Terrence and spent hours with him behind the barbed wire of that prison. Over time, Terrence began moving in a new direction. Eventually rejecting racism, he was paroled, and he entered the University of Mississippi, and he received his degree, and then he was called to be an evangelical minister. In speaking of his ministry among the Klan, Campbell put it quite simply. He said, Mr. Jesus died for the bigots as well. Do you see what we're talking about this morning? Will Campbell lived his faith with no fear of standing out. And I don't know about you, but there's something inside of me that resists that. There's something inside of me that wants to practice my faith quietly, wants to do it without notice, wants to blend in, wants to be able to have the life that I want to have and make my faith fit that life real well. Maybe a good question for each of us today is this. How would your life of faith be different if you were not a follower of Jesus? How would you spend your time, your energy, your love? I know of a family that used to have three kids. A few years ago, this family with three beautiful children thought about adopting a fourth child. The child under consideration was from Eastern Europe. They received a video of the child, and they took the video to their doctor, and all indications were that this child, whom they would adopt, had fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, the understandable thing to do at that moment would be to give up that particular adoption, right? I mean, this is going to mean a real change in the family. It's going to mean a sacrifice not just for the parents, but for the three other children as well. As the mom wrote, while they were disappointed and saddened to learn that their prospective daughter had this disease, they were not dissuaded. The mother said that they saw this child and they thought of her as their daughter in their home. And if that child had stayed over there in an orphanage, fetal alcohol syndrome, no parents, What hope does the child have? But if she comes to live with them here, she still has the disease, but she'll also have a family, and she will also have hope. And that mother wrote, isn't that the gospel? To be family for people who have no family? To give hope to people who have no hope? And the parents adopted that child. Now, I know that is not always going to be the best answer for a family that considers adoption. Each family and circumstance is different, but for that family, it was their faithful response to what it means to follow Jesus, all of which got me thinking, how would my life be different if I were not 
a follower of Jesus, how is my life supposed to be different? Because I am a follower of Jesus. I'm reminded of what the late writer Flannery O'Connor once wrote. She said, what people don't realize is how much religion costs. They think it's a big electric blanket, when in fact, it is the cross. Speaking of the cross, do you remember what happens to Nicodemus in the Gospel of John? We don't hear from him again until we reach chapter 19. At the end of chapter 19, Jesus has just been crucified. And Joseph of Arimathea comes, removing the body of Jesus, but not just Joseph. According to John 19, verse 39, Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, now comes to Jesus by day. Nicodemus is such a wonderful character in John's Gospel. Not because of his extraordinary faith or his unflappable courage. He's wonderful because he's so ordinary. In chapter 3, he's someone who struggles with his faith. In chapter 3, he's someone who wants to follow Jesus but is a little scared, hesitant to follow Jesus. But by chapter 19, we learn that God has been at work in the life of Nicodemus, moving him from night to day, moving him from hesitation to courage, from just asking questions to taking action, we learn that God never gave up on Nicodemus. Just like God never gives up on you or on me in the midst of our own hesitations, our own fears, God is pushing us, prodding us, helping us to embrace all that the love of Jesus demands. I recall a once upon a time story. Once upon a time, there was a priest who had a dream. This old priest, he dreamed that a mother named Mary was coming to see him. She had some concerns about her boy Jesus, who was 12 years old at the time. So the priest spoke with her son. What's the matter, asks the priest. I don't know, says the boy. I I seem to roam the streets, wrestling. With whom are you wrestling, the priest asked. With God, the boy said. So in the dream, the priest takes the boy Jesus to his house, and he teaches him carpentry. And he takes the boy for long walks, during which the priest talks to the boy about God. And the priest describes God as if God were a neighbor, very friendly, someone who might stop by for a chat on a long summer's evening to spend a few hours with you, maybe even offer some good advice from time to time. Well, about a month later, the boy feels better. He goes home, he stops wrestling. Many years later, the priest hears that the boy Jesus, who's now an adult, is doing fine. That boy is now in his 40s and has become the best carpenter the town of Nazareth has ever had. He is liked, he is accepted, he is successful. And then the priest wakes up. Now, I know that's a once upon a time story. What do you think that story means? What do you think that story means? To be liked, to be successful, nothing wrong with all that unless you're Jesus. If you're Jesus, you wrestle with God, struggle with God, one day put down your carpentry tools, and you follow God not just through controversy, but all the way to the cross. If you're Jesus, that's what you do. So let's be clear about something. Um, Anybody here think they're Jesus? I see no hands in the air. Good, good, good. Anybody here a follower of Jesus? Yeah, you don't have to be timid. You can put your hand in the air. Good. If you are a follower of Jesus, what do you do? 
Do you struggle sometimes with God? Do you struggle sometimes with how far you should go to show the love and the grace of God, to give hope to people who have no hope? How far do followers of Jesus go? Do they go as far as loving their enemies? Do they go as far as forgiving someone not just seven times, but 70 times seven? Be careful how you answer that. Be careful. Because if you go far enough in your answer, you might look a little different to people out there you might just start standing out. 